Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of the Washington Bike Walk Roll Summit. Just going to begin by welcoming some people in. Um, as you enter the space, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat feature. Let us know who you are, where you're coming from. And we will sit tight for a little bit while everybody filters in. And we'll start soon. All right, once again, good morning. Welcome. You are in the session for equity and the future of our urban rail transit systems. We'll be hearing from four speakers today. Thanks so much for joining on this early Tuesday morning. And yes, if you haven't already, feel free to enter in your uh, do a little intro in the in the chat feature. Let us know who you are, where you're coming from, and we'll get started with the presentation in about a minute. Okay, thanks for those who are providing little intros in the chat. We're gonna get started soon. Good morning, everybody. Like I said before, you're in day two. Of, we're in day two of the uh, Washington Bike Rock Roll Summit. And this session is equity and the future of our urban rail transit systems. Uh, I'm Rachel Schaefer. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Seattle Advocacy and Policy Manager for Cascade Bike Club. Um, welcome to the summit. We're excited to have you with us for this five-day virtual event, and we're thrilled to see folks from so many communities around the state um, and beyond. We would like to start with the land acknowledgement. This summit is virtual, and those participating are joining us from many lands. We acknowledge that the land that Cascade Bicycle Club sits on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. And if you don't know what land, whose lands you're on, look in the chat in a minute where you'll see a link to a map you can use to look up your place on the land. Without them, we would not have access to this environment and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. And we'd also like to note that we are um, recording this session and it will be available after the summit. Okay, so this summit is hosted by Cascade Bike Club and, um, oops, I'm not sure what happened to my screen. Just a second. There it is. Uh, this summit is hosted by Cascade Bike Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of bicycling for all. Cascade serves bike riders of all ages and abilities throughout Washington state, educating new riders, advocating for safe places to ride and holding events and rides. Washington Bikes advocates for bicyclists rights, endorses political candidates, holds officials accountable and works to shape policies that will make bicycling safe and accessible for all. And we wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors whose collective contributions have enabled us to um, bring together 15 panels with expert speakers with registration free for all attendees. So thanks to our sponsors, Amazon and the Washington State Department of Transportation. And now I'll quickly introduce the session and the panelists. Our panelists are Sol Dressa from Move Redmond, Dr. Brian Cole from UCLA, Elizabeth Guevara from Sound Transit and Alex Brennan from FutureWise. Uh, by 2024, more than 20 new light rail stations are coming online in the Puget Sound region and Spokane and Vancouver will have launched new bus rapid transit lines. With these new changes happening across the region, many stakeholders, including community leaders, workers, equity advocates and planners ask who will benefit. Will the advantages of living along light rail be shared by households of different incomes and by people of all races and ethnicities? Join us to discuss how we rethink urban rail transit systems and how growth will affect communities in the short and long term. 
So after this introduction, we will have a discussion with the four panelists and then some time for questions and answers at the end. And please um, insert your, uh, ask your questions along the way in the chat bar and our chat monitors will direct those to myself to ask the panelists at the end. There, finally, there will also be a uh, feedback form on this session provided through a Google form that you'll see at the end of this session. And with that, I will stop sharing my slides and let, uh, I believe Sol has the slides and I'll let the panelists get started. See. Perfect, thanks Rachel. Uh, let me get my slides up real quick. I also have an assistant here with me today. Can y'all see that? Hopefully, yes. Are the slides visible? Yes. yes, you are good to go. Cool. Um, so my name is Sol Dressa. Uh, my pronouns are they, she. Um, and I am the transportation specialist at Move Redmond. Um, Move Redmond is the advocates for walking, biking, and public transit in Redmond, Washington. And to learn more about um, the work that we do at Move Redmond, head to our website and subscribe to our action alerts at moveredmond.org. And I'll put that in the chat in a second. Um, a little bit about me, I come to uh, transportation justice work through a public health background. Um, a lot of my work has been focused on the built environment and seeing sort of examples of what, you know, a good design looks like and how that facilitates a healthy environment. And I've taken public transit all my life, taken it by myself since I was seven years old um, and moved from Portland, which had an extensive transit system to LA where I began taking public transportation um, to campus. So a nine mile trip easily took about an hour and a half to two hours plus transfers. Um, and this brought to my attention issues surrounding accessibility and historical narratives um, that racist, racist dynamics such as uh, red zoning play on our public transportation infrastructure. And this relates a lot to the conversation that we're having at Move Redmond now. Uh, recently, we had a walk and talk um, held near the future Overlake Village Light Rail Station in Redmond. And we had a couple goals. Uh, one was to experience the surrounding area as a resident, commuter, shopper. Um, and the second thing was to evaluate the safety and the quality of life uh, of the pedestrian experience. Um, another goal was to sort of create feedback and create community input on the future development near uh, the future Overlake Village Station and the recommendations collected from the folks that did participate um, would be sort of utilized in the transit-oriented development process um, by Sound Transit. So I want to put a bit of context for today's um, panel. Uh, today we're focusing on uh, transit-oriented, oops, oops. Uh, today we're focusing on transit-oriented development um, and transit-oriented development, or TOD, as folks call it, is a planning and design approach that seeks to create compact, mixed-use, pedestrian-oriented neighborhoods around newer existing public uh, transit stations. And we're seeing that a lot in Seattle. We're seeing that a lot in Redmond um, uh, right now. And to understand how to create equi equitable TODs around our light rail transit systems, we need to understand a couple of things. Um, land use policies and how that dictates aspects of our lives, including transportation, housing, health, and systemic policies that uphold racism. Um, uh, so stakeholders, including community leaders, workers, equity advocates, and planners should partner with peers in transit to promote, you know, equitable transit-oriented development. And this is essential to building and sustaining, one, a vital economy, two, a diverse housing market uh, and access to economic advancement. And our panelists today bring sort of different perspectives and backgrounds um, and therefore come in with sort of unique and intersectional lenses for transit-oriented development. Um, so I'm going to introduce them. Uh, so our first panelist is Alex Brennan, who's the executive director at FutureWise. Uh, Washington State's leading advocate for a smart land use policy. Alex comes to FutureWise after eight years at Capitol Hill Housing, where he served as senior planner 
um, and then as executive director of the Capitol Hill Eco District, a neighborhood based community development and environmental sustainability initiative. Prior to his time at Capitol Hill Housing, Alex worked in the Bay Area as a researcher and planning economics consultant. He holds a master's degree in city planning from the University of California, Berkeley. Alex was born and raised in Seattle. Our second panelist is Dr. Brian Cole. He's a program manager and lead analyst for the Health Impact Assessment Group at the UCLA School of Public Health, conducting and providing technical assistance on health impact assessments on a wide range of public policies and projects, including living wage ordinances, urban redevelopment, um, school programs, and transportation projects. Overlapping his work in HIA, Dr. Cole is also engaged in research on the environmental determinants of physical activity in school, workplace, and community settings. He teaches courses in school-based health education and community organization uh, for public health promotion. And he was previously my professor. Uh, our third panelist is Elizabeth Guevara. Uh, Elizabeth is a senior communica uh, community engagement specialist for the East Corridor for Sound Transit. Her primary responsibilities are working with local businesses and stakeholders in Bellevue and Redmond during the light rail construction. She has seven years of experience in construction construction communication. Prior to working in Sound Transit, she worked as communications consultants for clients like QEP corporations and washed out on infrastructure mega projects like State Route 520 floating bridge and landings. Elizabeth graduated from Seattle University with a bachelor's degree in strategic communications. Thank you again for our panelists for being here. I will now hand it off uh, to our first panelist, Alex, uh, who will give uh, sort of a background on TODs. And just let me know when to go next, and I will do that, Alex. All right, uh, thanks, Sol, um, and, and thanks so much for having me today. Um, so I'm gonna particularly talk about uh, how uh, you in the audience can be an advocate in your community to influence transit-oriented development, or TOD. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why TOD, or, or actually maybe a better title for this first section is um, some of the successes that uh, we've had uh, over the last decade, um, and then talk about uh, some of the regional advocacy that's kind of already happened that uh, can lay the foundation for local advocacy around TOD and then uh, talk about those local opportunities a little bit more and then kind of come back to the state and regional level at the end. Next slide. Um, uh, you know, FutureWise works uh, statewide and I was really excited in the chat to see so many people from all over the state. Um, I, my presentation today is pretty Central Puget Sound focused, but I just want to preface that with, uh, you know, this, um, a lot of these things apply uh, in Spokane and the Tri-Cities, in Yakima and in, in Vancouver, um, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Um, and you can just jump to the next slide again, too. Uh, so, you know, I think we often don't take a minute to kind of celebrate some of the successes that uh, that we've had. And um, one of those is that over the last decade, um, Central Puget Sound in particular has seen uh, some of the biggest increases in transit ridership and uh, some of the biggest decreases in per capita vehicle miles traveled or BMT um, in the country. Um, and I'm going to, I'm just going to apologize now for, I'm going to be using TOD and BMT a lot. Uh, in this short presentation. Um, so you can see some of that data on this slide, next, uh, next slide. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, one of the big reasons from my perspective is the amount of transit-oriented development that we've seen. Um, and we just got some great data on this from the US Census last month, um, when for the first time we were able to calculate population-weighted densities for um, uh, metropolitan areas across the country and found that uh, Seattle or the Puget Sound region had the biggest increase in population weighted density, which is sort of the most uh, meaningful measure we have of density um, in the country. Next slide. And that's particularly noticeable when you look at other metros that have 
um, that you know sort of already have a significant amount of density. The the other two uh, places that increased a lot, Charlotte and Atlanta, are some of the least dense metros in the country. Uh, when you look at Seattle compared to the other uh, densest 12 metros, you see that not only in the last decade did we uh, leapfrog Las Vegas, San Diego, and San Jose, but that the Seattle region is actually now denser than Miami, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia were a decade ago. And a big part of that is because of all of the growth that we've seen around uh, transit stations. Next slide. The the other big thing is about how that development has been built. And, um, you know, it's not enough just to put some buildings near a station. You have to have those buildings be part of a community that's oriented around transit and walking, biking, and rolling. And a big part of that is uh, how much parking you're putting in these buildings. Um, and so we've seen a really dramatic decrease in parking and new construction um, over the last uh, decade or so. Um, getting us back to the levels that we saw in the 1940s and 50s. Next slide. Um, but there, there are some problems too, some limitations and some problems. So, so one of the, the limitations that I wanna highlight uh, first is that most of this has happened within the city of Seattle limits. Um, Redmond actually has done, done a lot of uh, work too. And I think Move Redmond can take some credit for that. Um, but uh, you know, looking at this, a lot of that, that, those density changes, a lot of that parking decline is really within the Seattle city limits right now. If we want those trends to continue, we have to figure out ways to um, build the advocacy infrastructure and make those changes happen in more parts of the state. Next slide. Um, and, uh, and then there's, there's some downsides to, some really big important downsides to the um, changes that we've seen and, and challenges that we haven't figured out good ways to address. And one of the biggest ones of those, um, and we'll be talking about equitable TOD, I think a lot later is uh, affordability. And this is just an example from uh, the Capitol Hill neighborhood. And I'm gonna talk about that station uh, a little bit more in a second, but you can see over the last decade, we've just seen a skyrocketing of rents. Um, and uh, this isn't solely the result of uh, light rail opening in the neighborhood, but um, you can see that we haven't been able to kind of fully address the affordability issues to keep these neighborhoods inclusive. Um, next slide. Um, at the same time, though, there's some, there's some good things. As, as a local advocate, you have some wind at your sails from regional efforts that have uh, advocacy efforts that have been completed over the last several years. Um, one of those is uh, Vision 2050, the, the new regional plan for Central Puget Sound uh, that uh, really has a lot of tools in it to promote transit-oriented development and affordable housing near transit. Next slide. And another piece of that, um, I think, is really the, the transformation of Sound Transit from an agency that a decade ago was very focused on building out the system and not really interested in transit-oriented development, um, and that I think has really transformed itself over the last several years to a national leader in terms of transit agencies that think about development around their stations. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk about a, a particular uh, case of TOD um, in the Capitol Hall neighborhood. This is a surplus property that Sound Transit owned um, and a development project that, that happened there uh, before some of these regional changes I just mentioned happened, um, thanks to a, a partnership between community advocates, the transit agency and the city. Next slide. Um, I want to highlight just a, a couple kind of um, key uh, things that made that effort successful and then some of the outcomes that we were able to achieve as part of that. Um, one of the key efforts, and I think this is important for folks thinking about opportunities in their communities, is to reach out to partners and build a coalition to make these things happen. Um, in this case, the Capitol Hill Community Council and the Capitol Hill Chamber of Commerce came together uh, to form a new entity called the Capitol Hill Champion um, that was able to coordinate their efforts to advocate for 
a shared vision for TOD in the neighborhood um, with staff support from a local organization, uh, Community Roots Housing. And I was that staff support for much of this time. Um, and that effort uh, was able to uh, really work with um, Sound Transit and the city of Seattle to make a lot of things happen at this site, including affordable housing, a big increase in density, and a variety of other neighborhood goals, um, including the first uh, residential parking uh, maximums in the city. Uh, next slide. Um, but these processes take a long time. Uh, it was over a decade from when the first community engagement around the, the station planning happened to when the, to this TOD project actually was completed. Um, and that can be a big challenge for neighborhood advocates. So figuring out a way to maintain capacity and um, uh, in, in many cases, hand off that capacity and to, to new people as people move or uh, just need to take a break from being involved is really important. It's also really important to understand that you need to get involved early and it may seem like the, that station is coming to my neighborhood years and years from now, or I, you know, the 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 process for talking about zoning or other uh, planning decisions in the neighborhood is happening a really long time from now. But the earlier you get involved, the more you can kind of set the agenda for what's going to happen. Um, so uh, that's a really important part of this too. Next slide. Um, and Continuing that advocacy is also really important. So um, in, in this case, about halfway through this decade-long community engagement process, um, a lot of the people that were involved at the beginning kind of took a break from being involved, needed to do other things with their lives. Um, and there was kind of a backlash of folks from the neighborhood who didn't want to see taller buildings near transit, didn't want to see low-income people living in the neighborhood, and tried to kill the project. Um, and so uh, the, the community had to kind of reorganize itself to turn back out and um, reaffirm its commitment to, uh, to this project. And, and this is the vote where that, that kind of all culminated. Next slide. Um, and that doesn't just mean showing up to uh, one meeting to raise your hand, um, though I like pictures of, of crowds raising their hands. Um, but it also means, uh, you know, ongoing planning and coordination meetings um, to really build out neighborhood capacity. Next slide. Um, and in, in this case, that, that ongoing neighborhood organizing led from a, uh, built on this sort of smaller site of surplus property that Sound Transit owned, which you can see highlighted in the, in the red box in the middle of this picture. So this is not the, the, best visual for this, but um, but building on that, when the city of Seattle started looking at uh, a major zoning change throughout the city, those advocates were able to achieve uh, a bigger um, density increase and bigger affordable housing requirements within the, the full walk shed of the station. And you can see those bigger changes in the hashed uh, marks that surround the red box. Uh, next slide. Um, as many of you know, in central Puget Sound, we have stations opening up all over the region in the next couple of years. It, this is a really important time to get involved. Um, and uh, this is also true in other uh, parts of the state as well. Next slide. And there's some other big things coming up this uh, next year that are great advocacy opportunities. I would be really uh, remiss for not mentioning that the state legislative session is going to be a really important one for uh, implementing requirements that local governments plan for uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled through land use and transportation decisions. Uh, FutureWise is leading a campaign to do that called Washington Can't Wait. You can find out ways to get involved on our website. Um, and then alongside that, there is a um, uh, plan, there's a process right now for developing countywide planning policies in central Puget Sound counties uh, that will wrap up next year. And those are also a tool to encourage local governments to do that. And 
both of those things are going to then culminate in comprehensive plan updates for Central Puget Sound cities and counties that are due by June 30th, 2024. Um, the same time that these light rail stations are all opening. Um, so the, the next two and a half years are just a, a really, I guess, three years uh, almost, are, are just a really important uh, time to be engaged in these issues. Um, and I think that's the, my last slide. Uh, thanks, Alex. I really liked the, the when you talked about sort of reaching out and building coalition. I think one thing that we're thinking about now, especially as we go to our next panelists, is building coalition with unlikely partners. Um, I heard about transit-oriented development through public health. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next panelist who will talk a little bit more about um, the intersection on transit-oriented development and health. Dr. Brian Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back up in Washington State. I'm originally from Olympia, Washington. Uh, I did my undergrad at Washington State University in uh, environmental science and biology. Um, and it's, it's wonderful seeing uh, a big Olympia presence uh, this morning. Uh, it's expected a lot of uh, great things, sometimes bad things, but a lot of great things come out of Olympia. So um, I'm uh, going to be talking about um, something called health impact assessment. It's uh, a tool uh, that uh, my colleagues and I have been working on since uh, the, you know, 2001. Uh, and we've been kind of the, the van, at the vanguard of bringing HIA practice into the United States. It's a tool that was originally developed, uh, actually a lot of people don't know this, it was originally developed by the World Bank uh, in the uh, mid 1990s and then taken up uh, first in Europe, Canada, Australia and other places, finally the United States in the early 2000s. Uh, and the idea behind health impact assessment is, uh, it's a little bit like environmental impact assessment but don't take that similarity too far, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of dangers in, in doing that. There's some really important distinctions. But the, the concept is to encourage, um, you know, intersectoral uh, learning and to bring together both expert knowledge and local community knowledge to uh, anticipate what are the potential health impacts of different projects, different policies, and um, to mitigate you know, any potential harm, but also to maximize benefits. So we're looking both at the, the, on the, the benefit side and, and the, the harm side. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you the punchline of my whole talk. Um, uh, first, a, a little bit of caveat. I have a very distinct lens, uh, which is public health and also equity. Uh, so the, the punchline here is that uh, looking at what is an important thing, but who is just as important, oftentimes more important when it comes to anticipating, planning, and implementing transportation systems. Uh, if, if we're interested in impacting and improving community quality of life, we got to focus on who. Um, and so now I'll go back to the beginning of my presentation. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, health impact assessment, again, uh, we're aiming to identify potential health effects. We also are really concerned about their distribution. We're looking at proposed policies, also projects. Uh, we use an array of different data sources. We're really syncretic uh, and we use different analytic methods. We definitely consider input from stakeholders. And at the end of the day, we want to inform decisions. We want to produce actionable information. Uh, we've done, as uh, Sol said in my, uh, my intro, we've done health impact assessments on a lot of uh, elements, changes in the built environment, lots of transportation systems, uh, subway projects, California high-speed rail, 
uh, California state gas tax, moving on into to po transportation policy, lots of different, different issues. Next slide. Um, so this, uh, the, continuing with the, the example, so we have the infrastructure operations, uh, T, uh, transit oriented development, the topic that we're looking at today and funding, uh, which uh, is um, always uh, an important issue. And I think the public um, doesn't always fully appreciate uh, the importance of that in, in determining uh, both transportation policy and, and options for, for different projects. Next slide. So the questions that, that we look at in health impact assessment, we're, we're of course asking about uh, what are the health effects? Who's affected? Uh, how significant are how significant are those effects? Um, and uh, to appreciate what are the existing health disparities? Are these effects going to exacerbate, or are they going to reduce those existing health disparities that are out there? And then, what can we do to minimize harm, maximize potential benefit? Next slide. Uh, a a product that we will often develop in a, the course of a health impact assessment is something we call a logic framework, uh, where we're showing the causal connections between our policy or project uh, affecting uh, these, these first order effects. So like a, in this example of the California, changes to California state gas tax, we're affecting vehicle miles traveled, vehicle choice, mode choice, and so on. Uh, and these are affecting uh, what we call in public health, the upstream determinants of health. This is where the, the, the real, depending on your dietary preferences, the real juice, the real meat is in a health impact assessment. Uh, so in this particular health impact assessment, we're looking at the cost burden on uh, people who are, in this case, driving. Uh, vehicle emissions, traffic uh, congestion, noise, and uh, traffic safety injury risk. And then eventually taking those out to the downstream health impacts like air pollution exposure, noise exposure, and so on. Okay, next slide. Health equity is one of the core uh, pillars or, or, or values of health impact assessment. Um, and and this is uh, um, these these pillars are kind of agreed on you know, internationally by health impact uh, assessment practitioners that uh, we want to have um, equity. We want to make health impact assessment a vehicle for promoting equity. Uh, it's important to also uh, you encourage you know democratic decision making. That's kind of an assumption underline this, uh, that it's not just going to be top-down information and uh, decision-making, ethical use of evidence, and of course, sustainable development. Next slide. When we're talking about equity, um, this it, it is essential to realize that um, there's two different strands here coming together, uh, and this is kind of at the at the core of, of my work in health impact assessment is of course, we're trying to reduce disparities, uh, in this case, health disparities, uh, disparities in people's ex environmental exposures, in their opportunities and uh, in their health outcomes. But another core element of health impact assessment is that people are able to participate and determine their health. However well-meaning uh, policies may be, if there is not an opportunity for people to uh, in, engage and decide um, for self-determination, uh, then we've really not uh, been supporting real equity, real health equity. Next slide. So in a health impact assessment, here, here are like five different ways that uh, we, we may be considering health impact assessment. Of course, looking at the disparities, uh, what is the spatial or social distribution of the impacts, 
um, is there a, a symmetry between the costs that are being imposed, whether those are financial costs or other non-monetary costs, and the and the benefits? Are the people who are uh, whoever having costs imposed on them are they enjoying the benefits? Uh, community right to know, individual right to know uh, about what are the impacts that are uh, currently in the community and also that are coming down uh, the, the pipeline, so to speak. And then finally, again, is there this opportunity for uh, participation in a fair democratic decision-making process? Um, it's, you know, so often I encounter, uh, I'm sure this doesn't happen in Washington state, but in other places, uh, decisions are already being made and people are going through the motions of community engagement um, that, yeah, that is not, uh, that's far from ideal. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a really, you know, super simplified uh, logic framework that we'd be look, looking at in, in health impact assessment where uh, we, we have this change model and we're looking at uh, what are the potential changes in health risks. Uh, can you uh, go and yeah. Click the, the slide, please. And, uh, and then click again. We're also looking at changes in the affected population. Uh, and this is something that um, in my experience, I do a lot of work um, collaborating with colleagues in environmental impact assessment um, in both with public agencies and also with community organizations that are engaged in the environmental impact assessment process. Uh, and one big distinction that I see between environmental impact assessment, assessment and health impact assessment is this focus on changes in the population. Um, in our work in Los Angeles with on this, uh, our new subway extension, our health impact assessment of California's high-speed rail, these changes in affected population are probably as big, if not bigger, than changes in people's new uh, health risk exposures or exposures to potential health benefits. Who is affected by a project? Who can afford to still live there? Um, and what happens to those people who are displaced are huge impacts and I think they're underappreciated. That's all, thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Cole. Um, I was thinking a lot about sort of that planning process and what does active community engagement look like? Um, and that's something I learned from your classes is like, are folks being included in the conversation? When people talk about community engagement, what does that actually look like? And I think um, Elizabeth will talk a little bit about uh, sort of sound transits process when it comes to uh, community engagement and talk about a few examples of that. Hello, I'm Elizabeth. Um, thanks for being with us this morning. So I'm going to be talking about a TOD at the Overlake Lake Village Station. Um, next slide. So um, quick overview of East Link before we jump in. East Link is a 14 mile long extension connecting four cities, Seattle, Mercer Island, Bellevue and Redmond with 10 stations. And we're currently nearing the last milestones of construction and preparing for the operations and systems portion of the project. And we're currently on schedule to open in 2023. Next slide, please. So here's um, the station that we'll be talking about. This is the Old Lake Village station. It's located on the eastbound SR520 on 152nd Avenue Northeast. And you can see um, there's some amenities built into the station. It is an at-grade station um, and it has a pedestrian bridge that connects um, to a bike trail on the westbound side of SR520. Um, next slide, please. And here are some aerial views of the site. Um, th this is from last winter, but it hasn't changed much. Um, so you can see from the west and the east, um, it's a pretty, pretty nice size um, space. Next slide, please. 
So engagement at the Overleg Village Station, Sound Transit purchased land near the station that's highlighted in pink um, to store construction equipment and mobile offices through the construction phase of Eastlink. Um, after the station opens, we intend to make these properties. It's about two acres or about the size of two football fields available for TOD. So TOD and, and this space could include anything from housing, retail, restaurants, offices, and community spaces to support the neighborhood um, with direct access to transit since the station's just a few steps away. Um, we are collaborating with partners like the city of Redmond to explore the potential of TOD while planning for light rail. Um, we're providing opportunities for folks in the area to um, be involved and share ideas of the potential use for the land. Um, so community input informs our process um, to select development partners as we plan for the selection process. And after, um, we'll be asking for, there will be opportunities for the public to get updates and engage. So this past summer, we did our first round of engagement for this site particular, specifically. Um, and we heard from over a thousand uh, folks, um, folks that live, work, um, or go to school near this site. Um, and some of the key findings that we heard back from uh, folks was that housing should serve folks with different ranges of income, um, including market rate and low to moderate income levels. Um, this house uh, needs to provide opportunities for uh, multifamily settings um, and dedicated housing for folks over 65 um, or folks with disabilities. Um, housing should be, include bigger two or three bedroom units, even if it means building fewer units. Um, and the site should provide access to services for folks to live in the area and who use the transit station. Um, so that's what we've heard so far, but there's definitely going to be opportunities later this winter and early next year um, to engage again with us and talk about the potential of this site and how, and Alex mentioned early on in his presentation, there are other um, TOD uh, projects planned as we come into service with a lot of our um, stations here in 2023 and 2024. So there's a site down in the Kent Des Moines area, um, which if you're in that area, um, there's a, on our webpage, there's a version of myself, uh, so my counterpart who you can talk to um, and engage with. And then we have some sites coming up in the north uh, side uh, with Linwood. Um, so I would also encourage you if you are in either of those regions to, to engage with our folks. Um, we would, as Alex said, engaging often and early on is the best way to make sure that these sites are developed and reflect the community that we're building into. Um, our hope is that we really enhance the neighborhoods and um, we acknowledge that, you know, building light rail and infrastructure is very disruptive as um, the article just walked us through. So uh, we wanna make sure that we're integrating to the communities that we're, we're building in and serving. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I'm also going to put the link that you had sent me so folks could see ways to get involved. Um, I know I want to thank our panelists again for coming together and speak, speaking on some of those issues. Um, uh, we have, we're getting some questions in the chat. So I'm excited, excited to send those y'all way. The first question that we have um, is for Dr. Cole, are, or anyone, but are, are any state DOTs using health impact assessment in a similar manner to NEPA or environmental assessments? Yeah, so HIAs are not mandated anywhere except uh, there's some, there's a, Montgomery County, uh, Maryland, uh, ha has a requirement for health impact assessments. And I think it's just for transportation projects actually there um, that they need a chat in, in their uh, environmental impact assessments, they need a, a health impact assessment chapter or consideration. Um, outside of transportation, they are required for um, mineral extraction up in the state of Alaska, which um, is, is interesting. Um, it, there's a particular history uh, with um, indigenous populations 
uh, and health impact assessments being used to um, as, a, as a vehicle to represent their concerns and priorities. Uh, in California, we've, uh, we also do not have a mandate for health impact assessment, but many health impact assessments have been on, done on a voluntary basis in parallel to environmental impact assessments required by the state of California, California State Environmental Quality Act. It's pretty strict. Um, and, uh, you know, similar to Washington states, but, but there's even more, more to it. Uh, over the years, especially the EJ uh, sections of state environmental, uh, we, in California, we call them environmental impact reports. Um, ERRs have evolved to have a greater consideration of health and particularly health equity uh, considerations. And I think uh, there's a lot of influences there in that evolution, but health impact assessments have been a big part of that. The SR520, that is not a good example of a good health impact assessment. Uh, thank you, uh, Barb, for bringing that up. Um, there is a lot of uh, missteps all around. Um, and yeah, that was uh, a lot of lessons learned uh, on the, the 520 bridge project there. All right, we have some additional questions, things coming in in the chat, so I'll... Um move us forward with that. Let's see. Someone commented that a transportation related um, health impact assessment was done in Spokane, but the HIS showed um, negative health impacts due to lack of safe infrastructure around the investment area. So essentially it was encouraging cycling and walking um, or trying to encourage cycling and walking in the area, but showed increased, I suppose, risk for, for um, crashes and collisions. Um, so, Brian, I guess this is a question for you again, Brian. Do you have any suggestions for how um, an HIA can address these issues um, through incremental change? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that's what the, you know, when, when I see a, a HIA um, come up with, you know, either a thumbs up or a thumbs down for a, a project or a policy, I, I think that's really shortchanging the public, the, the real value uh, and, and I think that this is true for environmental impact assessments too, is when there are specific, you can make specific recommendations for tweaking a project or a policy uh, to, you know, you know, in this case, mitigate the you know, your negatives and, uh, and bring different stakeholders, you know, to the table and say, hey, we identify these uh, potential, uh, you know, safety risks uh, and go, you know, whether it's, um, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood or block by block, kind of, you know, work through that and, you know, find alternatives. Um, we, you know, I'm a huge proponent of active transportation by uh, bicycling. Uh, but when in Los Angeles, when I saw that um, there's a proposal for along Wilshire, Wilshire Boulevard is kind of the spine going through the center of Los Angeles from downtown to West Los Angeles, Santa Monica. And uh, they were proposing that bicycles, uh, they, they share the bus rapid transit lane. And that was just, it seemed insane from every, you know, for an op, you know, operational efficiency for the buses and for the safety of the bicyclists. And, uh, there was no reason that the bicyclists need to be on Wilshire Boulevard. We have a, a pretty tight grid pattern going through the center of Los Angeles. There are parallel streets, one, two, three blocks away, uh, where uh, you could put in a dedicated bike lane um, and, and keep bicyclists safe, keep buses, the bus rapid transit system operating safely. Uh, so, if we had just stopped at, oh, that's not a good idea to put bicyclists in the, bu the bus rapid transit lane, um, that, that's not helping anyone with any kind of decision uh, to improve transportation, safety, or health. Also, I wanna say Clark County has been, I, I think we have a couple of folks from Clark County. Clark County has done a lot of health impact assessments. All right, thank you for that. I have another question. Um, this is on the topic of community engagement. So I think I'll um, ask Elizabeth first. 
Um, do you have recommendations around how we engage with folks who are most often marginalized um, and most impacted by transit? Um, this question is mostly specifically asking about folks who are unhoused. Yeah, I can talk specifically about the work that we did specifically um, in this red run site. Um, my colleagues have had different outcomes on um, what they've done their engagement in the different parts of the Puget Sound. So we have worked very closely with um, CBOs in the area to make sure that we're reaching folks that are not, um, you know, that are not yet easily um, engaged in our traditional methods. So that's been very helpful. Um, the pandemic has been a little challenging to do um, in, in person, which I think is the best. Um, but, you know, that's something I miss from being able to do. Um, being out and talking to folks. Um, but that has been a very helpful um, way of engaging folks is working with community-based organizations in the area. Uh, Alex, I'm wondering if you have anything to add, um, whether with your role in FutureWise or because you have your, um, your background in the Capitol Hill housing as well. <laughs> um, sure, you know, I, I think this is, this is a really important, uh, a lot of times what we see in is that kind of the most privileged people in a community are the ones that feel the most um, comfortable or are the most connected to participating in community engagement on their own. Um, and I, I think also this has to do with how we often frame the engagement questions that there's, um, there's often sort of a framing around do you have concerns about sort of nuisance issues with changes? So um, a framing around like, are you worried that there will be shadows on your garden? Or are you worried about not being able to park as easily on your street rather than engaging the community around uh, a sort of positive vision? And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying this as a particular criticism of sound transit, um, but just I think in general in, in kind of uh, government agency engagement of neighborhoods. Um, th there's a lack of sort of focusing on the um, the impacts that are going to affect when we talk about like uh, unhoused folks or folks that are um, in uh, uh, unstable housing situations. Um, you know, in in the particular Capitol Hill example, um, we we didn't have uh, as much of a focus on engaging unhoused uh, folks, but we did really focus on engaging renters, about 80% of the Capitol Hill neighborhood rents. Um, but uh, when we were initially kind of doing this work, pretty much everybody that was involved in the um, TOD project was a homeowner. And so we knew that we weren't really getting feedback from people that were worried about increasing rents and housing insecurity. Um, and so I think, you know, one thing is just uh, doing some evaluation of like, who are you reaching and uh, comparing that with the demographics in a neighborhood to get a sense of, you know, what the blind spots are and then having a really proactive strategy to reach folks and talk about the issue that you think um, may be missing in the conversation. You know, if we, um, and we were able to engage more renters, I think, because of the focus on affordability at the TOD site um, and affordable rental housing in particular. If we had been just focused on um, transportation impacts or some of the, the nuisance issues that I mentioned, I don't think that we would have been able to reach those folks. Um, I actually have a follow up for you, Alex, as well, because I know FutureWise works in areas that are not all just, um, you know, dense metro areas. So I wonder if you have any advice for connecting with folks who live in more rural or maybe even suburban areas that hope to connect to transit in the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, the the strategies are, are, are not that different, right? Um, I, you know, I think thinking about who, you know, so yeah, as you mentioned, Mitchell, we have, we have staff based in the Tri-Cities and Spokane and Port Angeles. Um, and, you know, I think similarly in those communities, it, it's really surprising to me the extent to which communities across the state are really facing a lot of the same challenges, right? We have affordability challenges. We have challenges with 
um, being able to get around without a car. Um, and, and I think thinking about, again, you know, who, who are like leaders in those in the communities that you're trying to reach um, that can help you connect with, with their broader networks and how do you uh, frame the issues that you're trying to get feedback on so that you're, you're actually getting the, the perspectives from the uh, people that uh, are directly impacted by those issues. Yeah, that makes sense that the, it would be a little bit similar when you're talking about those fundamental strategies right there. Um, I have a question for Brian as well, uh, going back to Brian actually. Um, this commenter says that um, they you know, are a supporter of both EISs and HIAs. EISs are environmental impact studies, if I'm correct. Um, they say still EISs have been weaponized to oppose environmentally good projects. Is there a risk that health impact assessments may be um, can be used that same way to kind of, you know, delay or, or slow down things that actually are ultimately good for the community? Um, and what can we do to avoid that outcome? Yes, uh, that is so, so true. And uh, yeah, we, we see that a lot in, in California um, on, you know, and whatever the, the, the mechanism, whether it's a EIS, uh, HIA, uh, anything else, uh, they, they can always be used um, by, and, and it's typically, I, I think, not always, but uh, often used by more advantaged populations to oppose change. Um, I love what Alex said about engaging people around a positive vision of their community. Uh, when we did our health impact assessment of um, the cent uh, Central Valley segment of California's high-speed rail project. That, is in, that project has encountered so much opposition, nowhere more than in Kern County in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, where um, large landowners, um, um, agricultural interests, uh, oil producers have been adamantly opposed to the project. Um, there's no, you know, I've worked in a lot of um, different countries, uh, developing economies, and there, and some of the colonial legacies that I see in, you know, Congo remind me of what I see in, in Bakersfield. And in that kind of um, atmosphere, of course, HIA could be, what, you know, weaponized to, to use Brock's term. Uh, so what we did is we worked with youth groups uh, in in the community uh, on a uh, using photo something called photo voice. Uh, Soul's done this too, uh, giving people uh, you know training in uh, capturing what are the the issues in their community. What do they like? Uh, what are the problems? Uh, what is their vision for the future? And then uh, using their their uh, graphic depictions to help people articulate that vision of the future and then come back and say, how does this project interface with that vision? Is this project going to help accelerate our movement towards that vision or is it going to impede it? And how can it be changed so that we can move faster towards realizing that vision? Thank you for that. I think that's a, that's a really interesting uh, yeah, perspective to have on, on uh, yeah, recognizing the, the risks and opportunities with doing these, with doing these assessments. Um, I think we have time for one last question, a little, uh, if, it, if we can keep the, uh, the answer short. And again, it's back to Alex, actually. Um, Brock was asking, what is the importance of TOD for achieving uh, DEI objectives? Um, and or what role will Vision Zero have in encouraging growth at station areas? I realize those are kind of two different questions. Um, sure, and I'm sure other the other panelists may have thoughts on this too. Um, you know, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion goals um, in TOD. I guess from my perspective, you know, the the biggest piece of this is that TOD projects or uh, neighborhoods that have access to really high frequency quality transit create a lot of opportunities for um, 
the folks that live there to have access to good jobs, to have access to neighborhoods where they can um, have kind of healthy, active transportation in their daily lives. Um, a lot of these neighborhoods have a lot of other um, sort of amenities and resources for residents and that we um, see these places becoming more and more expensive and exclusive. And if we don't address that, um, we are just gonna kind of further exacerbate the inequality and segregation um, in our state. And so integrating affordability, preventing displacement in these neighborhoods to me is kind of the central DEI question. And, and obviously the, the engagement and making sure that the communities that are the most at risk of being priced out um, and excluded from these communities is a really important part of making sure that that's done right. Um, so that's on the um, DEI piece in, in short. Um, and you know, Vision 2050, uh, I mean, I think the biggest piece of this is it really directs a lot of growth towards um, transit uh, oriented communities, places that have high frequency transit. And so as cities are doing their own planning to uh, implement their zoning to accommodate the, the growth targets that they've been given, they're going to need to add capacity near transit. And so that creates a really opportunity to engage um, in how that happens um, and make sure that that's done equitably. Great, thank you for answering two rather large questions in, in a super concise form, that's helpful. Um, okay, well, we are at time. I wanna thank all of you as panelists for participating and sharing your knowledge today. Thank you to everybody who is in attendance and for asking questions and showing up this morning for this important topic. Um, our next session is at 12.30 today. It's called Lessons from Quick Build Complete Streets Projects. <laughs> And finally, there, um, take a look in the chat. There is a link to a feedback form. We would love if you fill that out to give us feedback on how the summit is going. And um, with that, we will hopefully see you later this afternoon. So thank you again. <laughs>